30-year-old Emily Godest is a survivor. Following a serious car accident 10 years ago, she suffered third-degree burns over half her body. She has undergone dozens of skin grafts. This is the mask I had to wear during the day. For two years, she had to put on her braces. So I slept with this on. It's a second skin, in fact. It's a bit of a burglar's outfit. Now, an archivist in the administration, Emily has decided to embrace her scars, her new face, especially as she is now convinced that her accident was not the result of fate, but that she was the victim of a Machiavellian plan. They wanted me to be like this. They not only wanted to kill me, they wanted to, if by chance I survive, my life has been ruined. Afterwards, maybe that's also why. I make sure I don't let him win on that ground. The man she's talking about is Johan, her boyfriend at the time. The law suspects him of attempted murder. At the time of the accident, Emily and Johan had been together for three years. They had met in high school and were engaged to be married. Emily is 20 and studying history. On November 9, 2007, she was a passenger in a car that crashed into a tree and burst into flames. Emily is transformed into a human torch. At the wheel, her boyfriend escapes almost unscathed. Here he is, Johann Boucher, 34 years old, a printer. He spent a year in prison. Since the tragedy, he denies having wanted to kill his friend. He agrees to return to the scene of the accident, a small road in the Paris region, in the countryside, a kilometer from his home. Look, there are deer there. Here again. Look over there, in the woods. It's super rare to see them, apparently, because they often move around at night. It's an incredible opportunity. For Johan, the presence of the deer that day is important, as he believes they were the cause of his accident. He'd hit a tree after trying to avoid an animal. Where the fence is. Between the two trees, you're going to have an animal crossing just behind that tree. Here, here, at that moment, I'm going to hit the steering wheel. The impact occurs at 40 kilometers an hour on the other side of the road. It's half past 11, a moonless night. I hit a tree, which unfortunately is nowhere to be seen. We don't know where it is since it's been cut down, but it was over there. I'm stunned. I can still hear the horn, and there's a lot of smoke in the passenger compartment. When I turn back to my friend, she already has flames on her. I start to help her, but she'll be out almost immediately. Johan gets out too. He grabs a fire extinguisher from his car and says he rushed to Emily's aid. She's just about there. The place has changed a lot, but she's just about there. She's still on fire. I arrive with the extinguisher, press it down. I can still hear it, but there's nothing. So I let go right away, take off my bag, throw it away, take off my jacket. I just push it off and put my coat on its back. And that's it. And then on her head. Just then, a motorist driving home from a party spots flames. He stopped and alerted the fire department. Here's his call with Johann Boucher screaming in the background. All right, I'm on the phone, don't worry. Good evening. Yes, good evening, I'm on the road to Chatenay. A car caught fire near a tree, but people managed to get out. Apparently one of the two people is injured. Who's injured? What's wrong with her? Apparently she had caught fire a little because her husband tried to put it out. She's lying there, but the lady is burnt, so yes. Is the person conscious? Yes, she's conscious. There's been an accident. Yes, they must have hit a tree or something, and then... The car's on fire. All right, I'll send the colleagues over. Okay, see you soon. See you in a bit. 
Ten years after the event, this witness, Joachim, who wished to remain anonymous, hasn't forgotten the scene. Focusing on the barely conscious Emily, he notes the nervousness of her boyfriend, who has only minor injuries. He kept repeating the same thing. I called the fire department, I called the police, calm down, breathe. I'm choking, I'm choking. You get the impression he'd bugged out on this. He kept repeating the same thing. But as I explain, I tell him that the girl looks like she's in bad shape. I'm trying to concentrate on your friend. And he was talking to me and not to her. And it's true that when you think about it later, he shouldn't have been talking to me. Is Johan in shock or is he hiding something? As the car finishes burning up, Emily is taken to the emergency room at Percy, a military hospital specializing in the treatment of burn victims. For several weeks, her prognosis was vital. It took three months for the gendarmes to hear Emily in her hospital bed. At first, she repeated what Johan had told her several times, an accident caused by a passing animal. But as the months went by, she began to have doubts. She has no recollection of seeing an animal crossing the road. She also remembers the trajectory of the car. She also remembers the trajectory of the car, turning without braking in the direction of the tree. Above all, Emily asserts that another memory would have come back to her, her boyfriend's attitude just after the crash. I called out to him to come and rescue me. I couldn't see him, but I knew he was watching me burn. At one point, I said to myself, this is it, I'm going to die here. And the fire went out. At the time, it was, I'm still alive. And then all of a sudden, I felt a mass coming towards me. It was the driver. He wrapped his jacket around my head. He squeezed the jacket in front of my face putting pressure on it. That's when I said to myself, that's it, he's killing me. Why would Johan want to kill Emily? In this album, from which she had removed all the photos of her former companion, the memories of her last trip with him, on the Côte d'Azur near Antibes, two months before the accident, at the home of her great aunt Claudine, she hosted the couple for a fortnight. She hadn't really fallen for Emily's fiancé. Above all, I had the feeling that Emily had trapped herself in this engagement affair, that she didn't really want him but didn't dare say no, in fact. He was a bit... a bit bossy. Somebody who was trying to get a grip on her, and if she married him, I don't think she would have had a say in a lot of things. The decisions were made by him anyway. He really had a hold on her. Interviewed again by the gendarmes seven months after the accident, Emily explains that she had wanted to leave Johan for a long time. He had blackmailed her into committing suicide and had hit her. Even though they denied everything and swore they were still in love, a judicial investigation into the attempted murder was opened. Investigators study Johan's cell phone and discover that, the day before the tragedy, he activated a terminal near this station, where Emily was standing on the platform, kissing a boy. Did Johan Boucher catch the scene? He denies it. But according to Emily's lawyer, his presence at the scene was no coincidence. He had been watching the young woman for several days and was acting out of jealousy. She wanted to leave him. She was meeting someone the day before. She was going to spend the evening with him that same evening. Two hours before she was due to meet him, she was set on fire in her car, and the driver was her ex-boyfriend, who we now know knew that she had met someone, that he had been watching her, and that he knew that she had met someone, and that his girlfriend was set on fire in an accident that happened at 40 kilometers an hour when he didn't break and saw a tree. Investigators reconstructed the evening's events. At around 10 p.m., Johan picks up Emily from the hypermarket where she works at the weekend. While waiting to pick her up, he did some shopping in the store. In particular, he buys a bottle of methylated spirits to make a fondue. 
the couple hit the road. Emily asks Johan to drop her off at a party to which she is not invited. Johan makes a detour, he says, to pick up a video store card from his house. That's when he hit the tree. The investigators are looking into the circumstances of the accident. There were no braking marks on the road. They are also wondering why Emily turned into a human torch. The first experts established that the fire did not originate in the car itself, but was caused by something external. Traces of methylated spirits were found on the passenger seat. According to the prosecution, Johann Boucher, seen here during a reconstruction, sprayed Emily with rubbing alcohol as she tried to get out of the car. More than a year after the accident, he was indicted and imprisoned for six months. Johann Boucher fiercely denies his involvement and, to prove his innocence, calls in a number of private specialists, such as this former commissioner of the criminal brigade, in charge of studying all the expert reports. A former stuntman, he insists that Johann Boucher could not have premeditated such a complex and perilous operation. We can't imagine that it was the product of a deliberate and controlled trajectory because you don't go and kiss a tree in the middle of the car. There's such danger, they say he wants to kill his passenger. I think he's as much at risk as his passenger, but he's not suicidal. I think he could have chosen another way if he had wanted to kill his companion than this type of accident. The former stuntman explains the absence of braking marks by the activation of the vehicle's ABS system, which would have prevented the wheels from locking. That's it, we're out of Chateauneuf. Even his parents are mobilizing, as in this video they filmed themselves, to prove that we couldn't see anything that night. We're going 40 kilometers an hour. The blue arrows didn't exist. And then the accident happened at the first post. A chemist commissioned by Johann Boucher demonstrated with video that methylated spirits can ignite at the touch of a spark. Inflammation is immediate. According to Johann Boucher's lawyer, Claude Laurenté, the bottle of methylated spirits on the back seat of the car could have started the fire on its own. It's a bottle in the back with the bag or without the bag, we don't know. It goes on the front board, it opens. There's a spurt which unfortunately goes on the passenger. She's wearing a synthetic garment. It creates static electricity, which discharges when she puts her hand on the handle of the car. When she put her hand on the metal handle. The lawyer mentions other possible triggers for the fire. There are a lot of wires that could be short-circuited, he says, and you had the horn going off all the time. Wires heating up, alcohol falling on them, steam, inflammation, the beginnings of inflammation. Psychological assessments revealed Johann Boucher to be a narcissistic personality and an inability to tolerate emotional frustration. But he disputes the findings and claims to be the victim of a miscarriage of justice. I'm not going to let it happen, that's for sure. I'm going to fight because there have been a lot of problems in my case. There are a lot of elements that will allow me to go all the way to the European court. In any case, that's it. As for Emily, she's waiting to find out what really happened that evening. Today, she wants to enjoy the present. The doctors have given me a second life, so I'm not going to shut myself away. I prefer to live my life to the full. And then, never mind the scars and everything else. I just want to live. The trial will take place in the coming months before the Valdoise Assize Court. Her ex-fiancé, accused of attempted murder, faces a life sentence. 